So our first little focus is going to be on type 2 diabetes. So I'm not going to talk about type 1 diabetes. Um, there's a very good in-detailed course on the Wusser Family Medicine webs, um, YouTube channel that's been run by Dr. Kayembe, specifically looking in, in detail at what I'm just going to do as brush strokes over here. And you are, I'm hoping this will encourage you to go and read and look further. So firstly, importantly, you have to be able to diagnose diabetes. So it's all very simple when you've got a real symptomatic sick patient. Don't worry about this. They come in with diabetic ketoacidosis. You know they're really sick. You're going to put them on diabetic treatment. What's more unclear is what do you do with that patient? You know they do HCTs on everybody when they arrive in Ward 5, and now the blood sugar is 9.5. So what do I now do to say my patient definitely have type 2 diabetes? And for asymptomatic patients, so patients we are screening or patients with hypertension or type TB and we test their HETs and it's a bit higher, you want at least two separate tests in two different weeks, in, within a two-week period. So you want to diagnose it quickly. HbA1c immediately is not very useful because it takes, you know, three months for our HbA1c's to change significantly. Random glucose is very variable. And so I think the goal for us, the best, we, we can do gamma D, um, glucose tolerance tests, but the easiest is simply to arrange two fasting plus, um, sugars, and our threshold there is more than seven. So who should we be screening for diabetes? All patients with obesity, regardless of their age, that at least has one other risk factor for diabetes. If you've got a guy in their 30s who's suddenly developing some hypertension and he's obese, you're going to be screening all of those patients. But notice, everybody over 45, we should be screening for diabetes. So that's a little bit what we're doing when people are arriving um, in Ward 5 in our outpatient department. There's an interesting concept um, that one can look out for when you're starting to do all these fasting blood sugars, and that is for impaired glucose tolerance. And this is quite a nice table to give you a little of a feeling around how glucose behaves. So notice that our normal fasting blood sugar is under 5.6 usually. So over seven is definitely diabetes, but between six to 6.9, we've already called that impaired fasting glucose. So they don't have diabetes, but you can use that as a way to start scaring your patient and saying, hold on, we are on our way to diabetes. You'll notice when you do your proper two hour plasma glucose, best way to do that will be with the um, glucose tolerance test. Um, only if it's over 11.1 is a diabetes, but look, a normal glucose tolerance is under 7.8. So if you're a young person with no insulin resistance, your glucose should not vary much over eight. So already over 11.1 is already quite a high um, random glucose. And then our diagnosis for HbA1c is 6.5% um, would be considered diabetic. But again, you're supposed to have two, two readings. So when you start and you've now diagnosed your diabetic patient, we want to do some basic initial assessment. Very important in our type 2 diabetics is keeping an eye on what's happening with their waist and the waist circumference in their BMI and to reflect that back to your patient. This is where we weight are at the moment. What is our targets for weight? Remember to do a good general examination on your diabetics. And then very important at baseline, we need to record whether there are already any end or organ target target organ damage. So quite often when we diagnose type 2 diabetics, they might have been diabetics for quite some time, and there's already other things going on. So luckily downstairs, we can screen their retinas, we can check what's happening with the cardiovascular system, and if you've got any concerns, you'll do an ECG. You need to check what's happening with the feet in terms of peripheral neuropathy. And when you do your bloods, so you're still on that search for any other evidence of end organ damage. So we're going to do our lipids, because this is quite often an accompanying issue. We're going to talk about dyslipidemia. We want to check our creatinine, because we're looking specifically for um, if there's any damage to the kidneys already. We want to know about our potassium, because we might be introducing drugs that could affect that, and insulin and potassium. Well, we're not quite on insulin yet. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then at the baseline, have at least have a urine dipstick. And unfortunately, we don't have able to test for microalbuminuria. So if your urine dipstick is negative, it's still good to have a baseline urine PCR, but we won't do those regularly if those were negative. And of course, in South Africa, check for HIV, check for TB, check for COVID. So we want to treat to target. And to be able to do that, we all know that HbA1c is what we're aiming for. 
and you're going to set a specific target for your patient. Now, the problem with HbA1c is, as you know, is we do it every three months. So you can't now go and decide to adjust your treatment every three months, depending on the HbA1c. That's not going to work. So you want to be using your fasting blood sugars and your random blood sugars to actually set in the short term what's happening with your sugars. And so what we're going to do is we actually want to get our patients on target within three months. I'm not going to talk around all the reasons why, the legacy effect, et cetera. Dr. Kamangele will cover that in the future. But what we want to look at is if we set a target, most patients we set a target at seven, but you can have young, very healthy patients where you might even set a lower target. And you can have elderly, fragile patients where you're a bit concerned about hypos where you might set a higher target. But for each of those, your fasting blood sugar, you're always targeting four to seven. That's what you want it to be. Easiest to measure, tell the patient not to have any breakfast before they come to, to the clinic and you can do your, your fasting blood sugar when they arrive. For your random or your postprandial, a bit more tricky to, because this obviously gets influenced by food, but you can see if you want an HbA1c of 6.5%, you're gonna have very tight target, even on your random sugars. Where 7%, we would like it to be under 10, and then you've got more play if it's under 8%. So this gives you an idea of what is my fasting target and my random target in my patient if I want to achieve that HbA1c over 7%. So before we look at the basic stepwise treatment, there's a couple of caveats with what you are. So I haven't mentioned you will need to do your baseline HbA1c because it's going to tell you a little bit how far down the line your patient is. So if your HbA1c is over 9%, you can basically assume they're going to end up in needing two drugs and they're going to need it quicker, sooner rather than later. So you're going to be quite aggressive getting them up to max dose of metformin and starting to induce, uh, introduce that clomipiride. But there are definitely indications of whether you're going to consider starting insulin right at the very beginning. It doesn't necessarily even mean you're going to have that patient on insulin for life, you're type 2 diabetic, but you might have to use insulin to get them on target, and then you might reduce the insulin and even get them off the insulin and see if you can control them on orals. And, and look at that couple. We get a lot of patients present with HbA1c's over 10%, and we don't necessarily have the insulin conversation muddle along with our metformin. But if they have a very high fasting blood sugar, a fasting blood sugar over 14, very high, a random blood sugar over 16.5, all those patients who come in really sick. So if they've come in in DKA or they've come in in a severe catabolic state, you might want to go straight for insulin right from the very beginning. But we're now going to look at the box standard patient. The HbA1c was under 10%, preferably under 9%. They're fairly asymptomatic. And we now just want to step-by-step step wise put them onto treatment. So with type 2 diabetes, your idea is that you add one drug at a time, you build it up to a maximum, and then you add in your next drug. So it's fairly, um, fairly well laid out. And of course, our first drug we always start with is our metformin. So the dosing, we're going to look at the dosing, but you're not going to remember all the dosing. These things are in your handy reference tools. If you're not sure, always look it up. So we're going to initiate our metformin 500 milligrams. You're going to increase that every two to four weeks until target. So remember, we have got those targets we've set with our fasting black sugar. And our maximum dose usually for a good effect is one milligrams BD. One gram, yeah, one grams BD, sorry, my mistake. One gram BD, or if they're very obese, you might have to use 850 milligrams TDS, but actually there's not much benefit in terms of your HbA1c, but there's some better effects in terms of metabolic profile. So you, gotta, you, you can imagine you starting, you see, in the ideal world, we'll see them every two weeks. Sometimes it's not practical for our patients. In an ideal world situation, two weeks, you check your red blood cell, your fasting, still high, go up the next step, go up the next step. Once you're on maximum dose of metformin and your fasting sugar is still over seven, now you're going to add glamoparide. And we mustn't hesitate because quite often our patients have actually been sick for a long time. They're going to need two drugs. So we can't go, oh, wow, gosh, they've only been on metformin for a month. Maybe we'll give them a little bit longer. The metformin should very quickly give you an idea of am I, how much it's going to reduce that, that blood sugar by. So glamipiride is our sulfonylurea of choice. We do not use clobenclamide, one of the old generation ones. We see that it's changed. We start off with one milligram, and you can increase by one milligram also, again, every two to four weeks until we reach our target, and our maximum dose here, four milligrams. If you look in the books, you will see eight milligrams mentioned. 
It doesn't have an awful lot of extra benefit. So usually by the time you're on metformin, one gram, lamipiride, four milligram, you're sort of, okay, still not on target. What do we do next? Make it a little bit interactive. Doc. <laughs> what do you do if you're like, still not controlled at this point? I think it depends on uh, what your options are. Yeah, other safe drugs like SPF2 and this is. Okay, so we're in public sector. You're down in Ward 5. What's, op what's your option number three? Uh, wait, on something on insurance. Excellent. <laughs> Which one? Excellent, excellent. So step three, we're starting with our long acting, it's protophane. We're starting with it in the evenings. There's a starting dose there of 10 to 20 units or 0.1 to 0.3 units per kilogram. And you're gonna titrate again every two to four weeks. You can even titrate quicker if the patient's able to, to do that themselves because they're gonna be testing their sugars now. Um, usually give it at 10 o'clock at night. And you monitor this with your fasting blood sugar. And I'm going to show you titration in a minute. So your fasting blood sugar in the morning is going to tell us what I need to do with my protophane dose at night. So it actually becomes quite easy. And you've got um, play until you get to about 0.5 units per kilogram. So at this point now, if your patient is now still on pro now on metformin, we're still keeping the sulfonylurea at this point. We've added in the protophane. And then at this point, if my patient is still not on target, now we're going to move on to the twice daily actophone. Okay, so this is our premix insulin. It's got both a long acting and a short acting into it. To work out your initial dose, you can look at how much protophane they've been having, and you can use that, or you can use 0.3 units per kilogram per day. And you start off by splitting it into two thirds and one third. But quite often, you're not going to end up long term on two third and one third. The two third and one third is not a rule that all patients should be on two thirds and one third. It depends a little bit on their eating habits. It depends on when they have their main meal in the day. It depends on what kind of foods they're eating with that main meal. But your sugars will tell you how much insulin they need. So we're going to use that fasting and random blood sugars to help tell us how much um, we're going to give. And I'll show you that titration in a minute. So classically with Actrophane, for those of you not familiar with them, you give it, you give your insulin, you have half an hour, and then you must eat something. So they're going to have to have the Actrophane twice a day, and you have to time it cleverly that it times in nicely with breakfast and supper. Um, and again, you're going to titrate those regularly. Um, and depending on the, your patient's level, they might even be able to do some of the titration themselves. So this principle is simple. Your morning sugars determine your evening dose. Your evening sugars determines your morning dose. And at this point, you've now stopped the glamoparide. So when they go into actrophane, they're going to be only on actrophane and the metformin. So this is in the, in, the, in the guidelines. And there's different ways on how aggressively you can titrate, depending on how many blood glucose levels you have. Um, so in this one, they're actually very uh, generous. So for example, say you say you want to put your sugars up once a week. Then you can look at the last two blood glucose levels, look at the average of those. If they're above target, you can plus two units. If they're under target, you can minus two units. Okay. So depending on um, whether it's the morning or the evening targets, remember you set those targets. If you've got a patient who is um, uh, quite able to actually understand and keep track and do their own calculations, you can almost do it on a daily basis. See what your morning sugar is and titrate the evening one, see what the evening sugar is and titrate the morning dosing. Um, and if you don't see patients very often, but you've got they've brought their whole little week's readings, and you can see if they're consistently over 10 or 8 to 10 or 7 to 8, you can actually titrate more aggressively. Again, this table you're going to go look up. You're not going to try and remember that. So you've got very simple rules to finish. You don't have to make it up, you just follow the follow the steps. Once they're on target, so you want to get them onto target within three months, ideally, certainly by six months, you want that HbA1c to be nice and stable. Um, and then we're going to be usually doing HbA1c's every three months. Sometimes you get patients where that HbA1c is sitting at 6.4% beautifully, and then you might do it every six months. Um, you're obviously always going to check your BMI and waist circumference and your blood pressure. And then every diabetic should have a proper annual review where there's a whole bunch of things you check. And again, these are the stable patients. Obviously, if, they were un, if there was any problems with the kidneys, you're gonna follow those up regularly. But in your completely well patient, you wanna check your lipogram recently, irregularly, 
you want to check your kidneys to see make sure your kidneys are not deteriorating you're going to do a urine dipstick and you can see r one c here remember to check your peripheral neuropathy do your retinal screening and check that cardiovascular system so you're looking for any other evidence that this diabetes might be might be causing damage and this is in the sense the guidelines for those of you who's looking for a nice easy way to screen for peripheral neuropathy just using your fingertips if you don't have funny filaments i'm not going to cover that now and then just important a lot of our diabetic patients also have chronic kidney disease so that's always where we get a little bit nervous so which drugs do i use when there's a table just to double check the table i myself get sometimes confused at the cutoff between the different ones um you can see with metformin you can't with metformin you can't give it once the eg well drop to 30 but you still have some play between 30 and 45 you just got to reduce your dosing Clomipramide, once the GFR starts dropping, you can still use it. Clobenclamide, you weren't able to, but clomipramide you can use. But you might have to drop your dosing. And again, your blood sugars are going to help you determine that. But if it's under 15, you definitely have to stop your clomipramide. And insulin is interesting. So sometimes people are, use, are nervous about insulin, but actually insulin is probably one of your best drugs with your chronic kidney diseases because it's the easiest to adapt it quite easily depending on what the sugars are doing. The risk is as the GFR drops is they need much less insulin. So you've got to scale down that insulin dosing quite dramatically as the GFR drops. And again, your sugars will help you or they're going to go hypoglycemic. So in your very, very low GFRs where you can use nothing else, insulin will be your main of treatment. Just a reminder, if they're on dolitegovir, you can have maximum um, one gram of metformin a day because of the drug interactions. We're not going to do a lot of discussion because there's like a million things we could say about diabetes. What I want you to take note is of the steps of treatment. I want you to take note of the monitoring bloods, and I want you to go and look it up when you're not sure when you're seeing patients. So sort of hand in hand with looking after our diabetic patients is managing dyslipidemia, but also in all of our patients. 